Well, yesterday here we did a memorial service for a wonderful lady named Lucy Miller that had been part of Red Deer for most of the 73 years of her life. When we were planning the service, the family said, could we um, do Amazing Grace in the service? Now, that always creates a little fear in the heart of myself doing the service because I knew that I would be probably the only one that would know how to sing it. And I don't do solos real well. So to my great relief, they said, what we would like to do is play it, and could we put the words up on the screen? And I said, absolutely, we can do that. For sure, we can do that. Um, before we sang it, though, I felt led to just tell them the story of John Newton, who wrote that hymn. Maybe you know the story. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, was born, I think it was about 1725, in London, England. He was born in a Christian home raised in a Christian home. His dad was a sea captain, and John Newton's first voyage in a ship across the ocean to Jamaica was when he was 11 years old. Somehow that got into his blood, and by the time he was 17 years old, he had signed up to be a full-time sailor on um, the, the, the trade routes that went over to the Caribbean and back to Africa and back up to England. Well, as, as you may know, he got involved in the slave trade. And uh, his life began to go right down as far as he could go down. His own account of his life, in his own account of his life, he says, I got so low morally and so depraved, he said that it was a good thing that God put me on a ship with a bunch of slave traders because there was no one that I could take lower. We were all as low as you could get. Well, it was um, on a ship called the Greyhound, which was really anything but, um, coming back from Sierra Leone in Africa, that outside of Ireland, they hit an incredible storm, a severe storm, and the ship was in great jeopardy of going down. And he says, for the first time in my life, I cried out to God from my heart to save me. And God, in his incredible grace, amazing grace, saved John Newton, completely turned this man around, a man who couldn't put two sentences together without profanities everywhere began to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He actually became a pastor in the Anglican church and wrote many beautiful hymns. Amazing Grace, in a lot of ways, is the testimony of his own life. But this was a man, John Newton, whose life turned right around. It began again. And I tell you that because we're, we're studying the Sermon on the Mount on Sunday mornings, and um, you get into this sermon in Matthew 5, 6, 7. You don't get too far into it when the question comes up, who can do this? Like, who can actually live this way? This is impossible stuff. You might feel that as you work through it. The answer is only somebody whose life has begun again. Only a new person can live the new life. And coming to Christ and putting your trust in him, God gives you his spirit who empowers you to live a brand new life so that your life actually looks different after you've followed Christ for a bit of time. So I bring you today to Matthew 5, and we're dealing with the Beatitudes, which is the character of people who begin to follow Christ. This is what they begin to look like. Um, I want to take you down today to the Beatitude in verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called children of God. But let me, as we've done every week, just read them to you so we get them deep in our DNA. Matthew 5, verse 1 says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew starts by saying Jesus began to teach his disciples. 
He ends by saying the crowds were astonished at the words he spoke and at the authority with which he spoke. So you have these two groups, disciples and crowds. It's not hard to imagine the people coming out of the towns and the villages to hear Jesus speak. And I don't think it's hard to imagine that to his first listeners, these beatitudes would have, would have come across as really, really good news. They were um, a declaration from Jesus, really, that he had come for the broken. He had come for the worn out, the run down, the sad, the regretful. I suspect that Jesus um, was talking to people who were really broken, who were really sad, who had deep, deep regrets, really sinful, people who really did need a fresh start. That, I find, makes it hard for us sometimes to identify with these words. We're not harassed and helpless like they were, um, like sheep without a shepherd. We're not really, really broken, a lot of us, like they were. Many of us actually are far from the kind of brokenness that they would have experienced. They would have had nothing. We have clean homes, clean water, and full kitchens. So how are we to read these words that Jesus first spoke to really broken, really worn out, really sinful, sad, regretful people with little hope? How do we read these words in our life today? Well, it's a good question because I understand Jesus to speak them to all of his followers. And I, I think, first of all, I would say it starts with an honest confession that, Lord, we're just not here. We're pretty comfortable people. Um, we, we don't live where these people lived. It's hard for us, Lord, to relate to what you're saying. And then I think it starts with a, a willingness to let the Lord work this stuff in us. To say to the Lord, we will follow you, but you'll have to do this for us. We cannot get there. An acknowledgement, too, I think, that for life, um, for most of us, life has to begin again. I think as I read these, I say to the Lord, Lord, I need a do-over. I need a fresh start. I need to let go of my values, the things I cherish, and I need to begin to embrace kingdom values. Father, unless you work in me by your Spirit, this is just information, just words, just stuff. You can't read it passively. Um, I think that's the only way you can read this when you understand who it was first spoken to. So let me come down to that beatitude in verse 8. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. We're almost done the beatitudes. One, one more next week, and then we'll launch into the rest of this sermon. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Right off the top, I think there's a couple of things you need to note about that beatitude. One is the word maker or makers. Jesus is not blessing peace seekers. He's blessing peacemakers. Jesus is not blessing peace lovers. He's not blessing peacekeepers. All of that may be important. What he is blessing, actually, is peacemakers, makers of peace. He congratulates them. He blesses them. He says to them, right on. Um, or, in the words of the German pastor that I quoted in the first, you lucky bums. That's what he's saying to them. You peace makers. Um, there's very few peacemakers actually in our world today. Um, I, somebody sent me this this week and I thought it was great. He, if you follow the news, you know what's going on in Kiev where the protesters are protesting against the government. Um, late last month, the Ukrainian president actually warned the world that his country was on the brink of civil war and it created quite a stir around the world uh, in terms of the importance of finding a peaceful way forward in Kiev. Well, happily, there was one group of Ukrainians who provided an example of what a peaceful way forward might be. They were actually Christian peacemakers. They did it in the most dramatic and powerful way possible. On January 22nd, as protesters and units of the Ukrainian police squared off on, in, in Kiev's downtown, they were joined by monks from an ancient Kiev monastery that goes all the way back to 1051, so a long way back. Actually joined is the wrong word. What the monks did was to place themselves between the police and the protesters. 
A photograph that I tried to find that I couldn't find last minute shows a monk holding a cross, facing the crowd, while a soldier behind him points a rifle in his direction. Instead of taking sides in the confrontation, the monks called on both sides to stop their fighting and repent. Instead of shouting slogans, they prayed, and they sang an ancient hymn, which um, goes something like this, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. They sang this hymn that day. Then something remarkable happened. The crowd broke up, and the protesters and the police agreed to a truce. Unfortunately, the truce didn't last. Ukraine is deeply divided, and we need to pray for that country. But on that occasion, on that day, they were peacemakers, not just peace lovers, not just peace seekers, but actually peacemakers. It's rare to find that kind of thing in our world today. What I find interesting is the incredible dignity that Jesus bestows on peacemakers. Um, he calls them sons of God. Now, in order to understand that, you would have to live in Jesus' world. I think most of them would have got what he was saying. When he said, blessed are peacemakers, they are the sons of God, he was actually bestowing on them incredible dignity. Because you see, in his world, it was the Roman emperor who was called the peacemaker. And the Roman emperor was called son of God. Everybody knew that. The Roman emperor was peacemaker and he was called son of God. But Jesus takes those words and he just, he bestows them, if I could use that word, on ordinary people. All the ordinary little people of the world who make peace, he calls them sons of God. I mean, he's turning his, his world upside down when he says this. He says that ordinary little Christ followers are um, in their minuscule empires acting like God really acts. So let me... Um, let me do as I've done most of the weeks, just throw out a few questions at this beatitude and see if we can get a hold of it. Um, first question I raised was, what does Jesus mean by peace? What does he mean by peace? Blessed are the peacemakers. I, I think it's an important question because in our world, um, we don't always mean what the biblical word peace meant. If I use the word peace, I might be referring to something on the inside, an inner, well, can we call it tranquility? Um, no matter what's going on on the outside, on the inside, sometimes I say I have peace, I have rest. That's not the word here. Sometimes we use it to refer to an outward state, an absence of war, conflict. There is peace in the Middle East. There is peace wherever. We, we talk about an absence of conflict or war being peace, but that's not the Bible word. The word is that old Hebrew word that you've probably heard many times, shalom. Shalom means life as God originally intended it to be lived. Life in the garden, shalom, peace. It means soundness, wholeness, well-being, but in every direction. When, when we use the English word peace, we're kind of thinking of a point, if I could put it that way. It might be my heart. It might be this little piece of geography, but peace. Shalom is a circle, not a point. And it really means in every direction possible, there's peace, wholeness, soundness. Any direction you look, spiritually, relationally over here, economically, ecologically, peace. It means wholeness in every possible area of life. It's a huge, huge word. It's life as it was supposed to be lived. To bring peace in Scripture is really just to bring community. Peacemakers are reconcilers. They bring people, they bring things back together in wholeness that somehow have been torn apart. Now, I think it's important to say, just to remind you, that when you go through the Beatitudes, we're not dealing with eight different kinds of people. Not that some of Christ's followers are pure in heart, and some are merciful, and some mourn, and there's others, though, that are peacemakers. That's not the deal. The deal is that every Christ follower um, is characterized by all of these things. So, in other words, Jesus expects every follower of his to be a peacemaker, somebody that works towards, if I could put it that way, bringing wholeness to every part of life. So, second question, why is peacemaking a mark of a follower of Jesus. 
why, why would he elevate it to the status of, here, here's the most important things to me if you're a follower of me. Why would he put it up there? Well, here's what I discovered, and maybe you could discover other things too, but I, I noted, I didn't realize this, but many, many times over in the Bible, God is called a God of peace. He actually describes himself on many occasions that way as a God of peace. For example, Romans chapter 15 and verse 33 in Romans 15, 33, it says this. It says, The God of peace will be with you all. And then if you just went to the next page, Romans 16 and verse 20, it says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That expression, the God of peace, just rolls through a lot of the letters of the New Testament. Somehow Paul and the other writers of the New Testament want to get into our hearts that our God is a God of peace. That's one thing that's worth noting. And then I, and then I remembered that when, when Jesus came, he was described as the Prince of Peace. Remember, um, way back in Isaiah 9, it talks about, for unto you a child is born, unto you a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, and among other things, he's going to be called, he's going to be called the Prince of Peace. That's Jesus. And I, and, I, and I read in the New Testament that actually what he did, his mission statement was to bring peace, shalom, between God and an alienated humanity. That's what Jesus did. Can I show you a couple of scriptures? Man, it's quiet in here today. It's, it frightens me, actually. It's like you're just blanked out. I mean, somebody nod or sneeze or something. You know, I mean, if your baby cries, just let the baby cry for a minute. It's, quiet in here. Um, thank you, thank you. Peace in every, peace in every direction. Um, now you made me forget what I was looking for, John. Thank you, Helen. This is getting better. Col thank you, thank you. Anybody else have anything they'd like to confess before we move on? Okay. All right. Colossians chapter 1. Let's go there. You, you're, you're, you're with me now, so that's good. You can, you can be quiet again. Col Col <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. This is, um, this is a great scripture when it talks about Jesus coming to make peace. And if, you, if, you try to, if you're trying to join the dots between God and Jesus, there's a lot of people that get God. Like, I know there's a God, right? I know, I know God's there, and I believe in God. But I'm not quite sure how Jesus fits into this. This passage will help you. Colossians chapter 1. And I just want to read a few verses from about verse 19. Um, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Now, who is him? Him is Jesus. So what it says is God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus. That means this, that part of God's plan, his big plan, his heart, his pleasure, his desire, was to reveal himself through Jesus. So that when Jesus came, he came to show us, tell us what God was like. God was pleased to put not part of his fullness, all of his fullness in Jesus. So the more you study Jesus, the more you understand who God is and exactly what he's like. Jesus was God with a face. That's what that verse means. Then it goes on, and it says, And through Jesus to reconcile to himself not one or two things, but all things, that shalom, everything, including the creation. God was pleased through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. That's a mouthful, but let me tell you what it means. God wanted peace between you and him. In all creation and him, everything, wholeness, peace. So what he decided to do was to send his son, Jesus, who is the embodiment of God, God in the flesh. But he came to die on a cross. And when he died on the cross and literally shed his blood, he was there as a substitute, making payment for my sin and for your sin. 
God punished sin. All the wrongs we've done. All the um, living as though God didn't exist. All that stuff that separates us from God, God took and he placed on Jesus. And he paid our debt in full by his blood on the cross. Now what's the result? The result is that people who were alienated from God are now reconciled, brought back together with God through Jesus' blood shed on the cross. That's an amazing statement. And it says that no matter who you are or what you've done or where you've been, you can stand before God free from any accusation. Isn't that amazing? Nobody can lay a charge that sticks to you because Jesus took all of your stuff and paid your debt in full. And he made peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, that thought is picked up by the same writer in another book of the New Testament, in Romans, and he, and he says this about it, kind of the implications of what God did on the cross. When we accept that by faith, God asks you just to believe him that that's true. Now, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So, understanding that Jesus was the embodiment of God and that he died on the cross for my sin, believing that, accepting that, it says here that I have peace with God. That I don't have to fear God anymore. I don't have to fear my heart suddenly stopping and going into eternity not knowing where I'm going. God is now for me, not against me. He's Father, not somebody that I have to fear. And, and the great privilege that we have is access to God. So I can go immediately into his presence at any time through Jesus and say, help, or thank you, or wow, or whatever. I can just come and be. Uh, I told you this many years ago, but I'll, I'll, I just bears repeating um, at this point because it makes a good point about this. That now, when the first time we were in Israel, we um, we were at the Western Wall, and um, I, I remember uh, a, a little girl uh, named Lise from Brooklyn, a Jew, um, saying to me, "You know, our religion, Judaism." is, um, she said, I, we can summarize it in one word. It's the word do. We have 636 um, rules, laws, and we do them. And I, she said, what's yours? And I said, it's Christianity. I can summarize it in one word, um, too. My, my word isn't do. My word is done. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, uh, when Jesus died on the cross, everything necessary for me to be right with God was done. I don't have to do anything except trust him. And she looked at me for a bit, and she said, that's quite amazing. And then she took a little prayer that she'd put on a little piece of paper, and she rolled it up, and she was sticking it into the wall, which is what they do there. And I said, why are you doing that? The answer was, because that western wall, on the other side of it, was where they figured Solomon's temple was and where the Holy of Holies was. And that's, that's the place on earth that's closest to God, to the Jew, the Holy of Holies. So they feel if they can get their prayers in the wall there, God will really hear them. I said, least, least, least. I said, when your word is done, you have access to God at any time, anywhere, at any moment. I said, I can be flying home to, to Calgary, and I can pray, and I'm as close to God as you think you are here. Through Jesus, we have access at any time into the presence of the Holy of Holies, and there we can say, Father, help, thank you, or wow. It's an amazing privilege. Um, so where I was going with this was basically this. Why is peacemaking a mark of a follower of Jesus? God is a God of peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace who came to make peace. And if you hang out with them long enough, you'll become a peacemaker too. You can't be in his presence and not turn out like him. That's why peacemakers are called sons of God because that's who gets God's DNA. And if you're like God, then, then you're a peacemaker. That's the thought. That's the way it works here. Now, another question that I think is important, and we'll just push it down a little bit. I'm not going to get into, you can work out the details, but I, I raised this question for myself. So what does peacemaking actually look like in our world? I mean, I, there's no marches in Red Deer where I can go stand beside two opposing groups, at least not today. So what's peacemaking look like? 
When Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, what does it look like in Red Deer, Central Alberta in 2014? I just, I just put down four points for myself. If they're helpful, use them. But first thing I said is, Dan, be a person of peace. That's where it starts. Just be a person of peace. Um, a person of peace is really described in Matthew 5. The whole of Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount is really a description of a peacemaker. Um, if I look at chapter 5 in the light of be a person of peace, it would say to me this, Dan, get rid of your anger. Get rid of your anger. That's, it says that in Matthew 5. Get rid of your anger. Who are you angry at? What racial group are you angry at? What things make your blood boil? Get rid of your anger. Um, that's part of it. Um, resolve disputes in your own life. Um, Matthew 5 says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court or who's doing this or that. So where are the areas in your own relationships where you need to settle matters quickly? Resolve differences. And then love your enemies. How, how do you love your enemies? Well, you start by beginning just to pray for them. That, and if you have an opportunity to do good to them, you do good to them. So, you know, first of all, you deal with you. If you're going to be a peacemaker, you've got to be a person of peace. It uh, just seems to me that that's where you'd begin. And then secondly, I would say you need to take seriously the message of reconciliation that God has put into your hands. You say, what do you mean? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, um, there's this amazing place where it says if we're in Christ, we're brand new people. And, and it says something like this there. I'll, I'll just read it to you. Um, in verse 17, it says, if anyone is in Christ, of 2 Corinthians 5, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Life has begun again, would be another way of putting it. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as though God we're making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's a profound thing. What it's basically saying is this, that God made peace possible for anybody through the work of Jesus on the cross. The problem is, a lot of people don't know that. And how they're going to hear about it is through us. God, for whatever reason, committed to us the message of reconciliation. He landed it in our laps. So if Central Alberta and Red Deer are to hear what God has done, we're it. He's not sending angels. Paul's not coming back from the dead to preach to them. Billy Graham's too old to get up here. Um, it's us. We're it. We have this message of reconciliation. And if Central Alberta is going to hear, we've got to articulate it. So peacemaking at rock bottom is to be an evangelist. That's what it is at rock bottom is to actually take the message of reconciliation out there and say, look, folks, be reconciled to God. On his side, he's done everything necessary. Why don't you come to him and say the same thing? He, here's how to be reconciled with God. Here's how to tell people, okay? Just say to people, as soon as you can say the same thing God says about Jesus, you're reconciled to God. What does God say about Jesus? He says, I'm satisfied with what he did on the cross. I'm satisfied. When you say, and I'm satisfied with what Jesus did on the cross, you have reconciliation. When you and God say the same thing about the work of Jesus on the cross, you have peace with God. That's the message that somehow has got to be pushed out. So, how do we be a peacemaker? What does it look like? Be a person of peace. Take seriously the message of reconciliation. And then I would say, start in the small circles of life. Start in the small circles of life. What do you mean? In your home, in your family, in your workplace, in your school, uh, be a peacemaker. And you say, how do you do that? Well, um, there's a lot of people that just like to stir up controversy and stir up trouble. You, you need to brainstorm with God and say, what would it look like to be a peacemaker in my family, in my workplace, in my school, in my marriage? And, you know, just work it out. But I, I think it starts there. I mean, a lot of people, they... They try and leapfrog over that. Now, uh, th there's a man named Bob Pierce. Bob Pierce was the founder of World Vision. An uh, incredible heart for God and for the poor. The lost, the last, the least, the little, and the nearly dead of the world. 
um, did a wonderful work. The tragedy for Bob Pierce was his family was a mess. His family was a mess. He leapfrogged over his own home to bring peace to the world, but he never brought it to his own home. It seems to me that the place to start is in your own home, in the small circles of life. You set your heart to be a peacemaker. Um, fourth thing, remember that peacemaking will involve sacrifice. How did God make peace? Through the cross. Um, Isaiah 53, 5 says, the punishment that brought us peace was on Jesus, on him. So um, peacemaking will always involve risk and sacrifice. Um, through sacrificial love, often peace is made. The cross is not only the can I put it this way, the ground of our salvation, but it's also the shape of our salvation. Um, the cost is sort of, I think, spelled out in the next beatitude that we'll look at um, next week, the persecuted. It seems to me that the peacemakers are the persecuted. Um, that's often what happens, and maybe you've had that experience yourself. Um, last thing I would say is just this. Um, look for ways in our own community to work for peace. What groups, what situations need to be brought together? Um, how could God use us? I think part of it is saying, Lord, give me eyes to see my community, my city, the world that I live in. How can I be a peacemaker there? Well, I think that's enough for the moment on what it looks like to be a peacemaker. I think you have to work that out in your own life. Just one other thought, and then I'm done. What does it mean to be called a son of God or to be called children of God? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Interestingly enough, that's been the hardest one for me to work out in the whole Beatitudes. What, is, what does he say? What does he mean by that? I mean, aren't we all children of God um, if we trust in Jesus? So why this? Why now? A um, couple things I discovered. The word called means owned. means owned. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be owned by God. Kind of the thought there. And called or owned in the Bible. Um, usually has two thoughts that go along with it. One is character. Um, blessed are the peacemakers, for they have the character of God. What it really means is they have um, the blood of God in them, if you can put it that way. They're family. Blessed are the peacemakers because they're children of God. They belong to the family. There's an intimacy. That's the word. There's an intimacy there. Um, the peacemakers know God um, in a way that other people don't. It's an up-close, personal relationship. The other idea there is privilege. Not only intimacy, but privilege. As children of God, it means you can, you, can, you can live in His presence. You can come and go. As a child, you can say, Father, and you'll always have His full attention because, well, you're His child. He knows you by name. I mean, part of this has to be worked out in our own life. You look at your own children, and, and you know that Usually they're the center, the absolute center of your attention. You, they, they have your heart, and you have their back. You have their everything. Um, that's privilege. You know, I, I'm just going to tell you this. This is crazy. You know, I swore, well, not like in a bad way, but um, actually, now they just turned my mic off. Thank you. The Sermon on the Mount says don't swear, so I, I, you know, then I'm in real trouble here. So um, that you yes, be yes, and you know me no. I said one day, with a great passion that when I had grandchildren, I would never use them in an illustration. So um, that day came and went. Um, but can I give you one more that I won't ever again bring them up, okay? This is it, the last one. So for what it's worth. They'll be here at 11 o'clock. And um, every Sunday when they're here, if I'm praying with you at the front, they don't get that. They come flying down here, and they attack me and ask me to go with them. And so sometimes I just say quickly, amen, and I go. Well, because every Sunday, we, we actually go into the office area. And you can't go in there. It's all locked. But they think they own it. And because we have this little ritual, we go in and we feed the fish in my aquarium. And then they um, got a couple little treats in my desk that they get, and then, then we, we head out. They, they walk into the office area like they own it. When they see other pastors or staff there, you know what they, what are they doing here? They don't know that they're the ones that people should say, what are you doing there? The, the point is, they have my name. They have my blood. They, they can go in. 
and they can just be. That's the, that's the child of God deal. It means you can be yourself in his presence. It means that the angels of heaven, they step aside and make way for you as you make your way to the Father's presence because you're a child and you're named and your name is written on his heart and he can never, ever forget you. Blessed are the peacemakers for they'll be called children, sons and daughters of the living God. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word and by it we live. It feeds us. It encourages us, points us in the right direction. Lord, we pray that you would help us not to forget it. Remember that you said one, on one occasion that when your word is sown, that the enemy likes to come and he likes to steal it away. I pray that wouldn't happen. You said that sometimes we embrace it with joy and then we go out and we immediately forget what we've heard. And we pray that wouldn't happen. We pray it would take root in our life so that not only this week, but in the days to come, you would have a whole lot of peacemakers in Red Deer um, telling people about the peace you made, but also bringing peace in relationships at home and at work and in our communities and in our schools, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen.